My whole family, um, there was eight of us in the family who were all, who all got COVID, um, one after the other. But in that process, my mum lost her life. I had COVID as well, and um, so I, my mum wasn't well, so I had to look after her. My dad wasn't well, I had to look after her. All the family members weren't well, so um, yeah, personally, it was a big um, traumatic experience for me. In December, um, my grandfather was admitted to hospital on two occasions, but there's unfortunately the second time when he came back, uh, well, when he was in hospital, he was um, you know, exposed to a, a COVID positive patient. So at the time that they had discharged him, they said, you know, he's negative or, you know, he's been exposed. However, he should isolate. Um, that was only written in the discharge summary. So when he came home, you know, he had already seen us all at home and we see it in the discharge summary that he needs to isolate. However, we live in a joint family, as you can see, and it's very difficult to isolate. He's 93 years old, so virtually impossible. It just passed through the entire family. I don't think I am the same person that I was a year ago, and definitely not the same person that I was, you know, back in January. And a lot of it is because of the circumstances around my grandmother passing away. What happened to Ma? She was sick, yeah, because of? Coronavirus. Okay. Are you unhappy? Yeah. Do you miss Ma? Mm. You know, in Ramadan, for, I mean, usually things that you miss is where, where she sits on the table, her chair. I've never sat there since she passed away, you know, I usually don't sit in the places we will have fixed places more or less. Um, uh, but I remember uh, somebody said to me, oh, sit on, in Ma's place. I said, no, you know, that's Ma's place. Everybody was sort of overwhelmed. It was, it wasn't nice. Um, you know, sometimes we were doing seven, eight funerals a day. At the cemetery, Gardens of Peace, other funeral services, everybody combined, you know, sometimes they were doing 18, 20 funerals but a specific family who lost three, four members of their family. And it was literally, he had my mobile and he would ring me and go, Abu, it's granddad, it's grandma, it's auntie, it's dad. I remember acutely feeling very stressed and anxious about what was happening. There was lots of changes being done, particularly within the healthcare setting and how we provide our services. So there was stress from a clinical perspective, but also from a home perspective. Um, there's a lot of us, if not all of us, will have a, a member of the family that we feel is particularly vulnerable. And the uncertainty as to what to do if, you know, they became unwell uh, was acutely distressing at times, um, certainly because I personally have a couple of family members who would be very vulnerable to the virus. 40% of the NHS workforce is made up of Black, Asian, ethnic minority colleagues. I am certainly aware of personal um, stories of, uh, of friends and colleagues who felt that they were unfairly being deployed to the front line and therefore in more risky areas. They felt that they couldn't have a voice and, and, and their concerns uh, were not appropriately actioned. In terms of getting help from Uber during the pandemic, it's very hard. It's more like you and your own. When we had the first lockdown, there was not enough work around, but they still were taking 25% commission. In terms of PPE, we wouldn't get any help. We have to, I had to get from TFL website. But rent arrears start piling up. And to this day, I'm struggling. So I thought, wow, I'm multinational, treating these drivers like pieces of garbage. You know, 
sleeping for people is luxury. But for me, I can't sleep. I went to Hazard Parliament where they did a demonstration, IWGB. Then I got attracted by it. So I jumped out of the car, they had these banners. So I joined the march until evening. If you join the union, they will be able to help you. They have the authority, they have the power to fight against the multinationals. And some training rooms on this floor. When the pandemic was announced, um, we, the voluntary sector with the NHS, we came together. We became a food distribution hub for the elderly members of the community. Kensington and Chelsea is part of the inner city of London and um, we had all the impacts of uh, the pandemic. Um, we have in this area of London, for example, in North Kensington, it's a very diverse community and also economically quite deprived. So the impact was quite heavy on, on the community. There were people in casual employment and they were laid off, and, but they did not have any kind of like uh, alternative assistance. Uh, the employers would not have any obligation to support them, nor would they qualify uh, for furlough uh, schemes. So we had people like that um, who were completely out of pocket, so they had to come here to collect food packages and to just survive. I know Hackney quite well. I chair a community centre. We've got a, a, a diverse Muslim community here. Economically, um, not as advanced, as developed as uh, generally the, the indigenous communities here. We used to have a refrigerator there um, to store bodies. Sometimes, you know, five bodies in there uh, kept overnight, um, pending washing and uh, pending a space uh, in, in a cemetery. We've got prayer facilities, um, so people who come for Congregational Friday prayers, yeah. uh, so once the space is full there, um, then whoever doesn't get space here can use our hall here. So you'll see that it will be you know, socially distanced and everything. We've got volunteers there already standing by the doorway. We had our emotions. We had, it was a very difficult time because uh, we had to focus on getting the job done. But it doesn't really hit you until it really hits you in your, your family. You really understand the value of the work the two to three hundred volunteers did. Then you realise what service that you've been offering for other people. <laughs>